With modern semiconductor growth techniques, it's possible to grow layers of very well-controlled thickness and material composition, one on top of another. With carefully chosen materials, the entire structure can be basically crystalline, with all of the atoms lying on a crystal lattice. One particularly useful class of structures that can be made in this way are so-called quantum well structures. These are just thin layers of one material, usually with a relatively narrow band gap energy, sandwiched between two materials on either side of another material with a wider band gap energy. Typical thicknesses of such layers are of the order of about 10 nanometers or about, say, 40 or so atomic layers. They have been very common in the so-called 3-5 materials, such as gallium arsenide and its various cousins in that material family. They're used extensively, especially in optoelectronic devices. Most of the semiconductor, laser diodes and optical modulators use them, for example. And they're a very good engineering example of the use of quantum confinement. They are also a good practical example of the particle-in-a-box model. Here we will look at the density of states in quantum wells as another example of a density of states calculation. A key point is that we have to include all of the possible states within the plane of these layers, not just the quantum-confined particle-in-a-box aspects from one side of the thin layer to another. The electron can also move in the plane of the layers. So here is a sketch of a quantum well structure with multiple quantum wells in this case. So it's a set of layers, one on top of the other, of two different materials. And these will be typically grown on some substrate, which is usually a crystalline substrate. So for example, this substrate might be some single crystal gallium arsenide. And then we might be growing on there layers of gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. The aluminum gallium arsenides are what we will call the barrier layers, and the gallium arsenides are what we will call the quantum well layers. Typical thicknesses for these layers in these kinds of quantum well structures are about 10 nanometers or so. So here, starting on this gallium arsenide substrate, we presume we have grown an aluminum arsenide layer followed by a gallium arsenide layer, and so on. Now, in such a material, the electrons in the holes both see lower energies inside the well than they do in the barrier. And this gives us particle-in-a-box quantum confinement in one direction, in this direction. And it so happens in this material that both the electrons and the holes see lower energy inside the gallium arsenide layer. So we can draw diagrams for these structures. This is the potential well for the electron. This is technically electron energy in the vertical direction. And we're plotting here the first two confined levels in one direction, sitting them on top of their energy eigenvalues. And then similarly, the holes, the diagram we have to look at upside down because higher hole energy corresponds to further down in this diagram because this is a diagram drawn with electron energy in the vertical direction. So the whole energy here is increasing in whole terms as we go down here. So this seems like low energy for holes here and higher energy here. And the holes also are quantum confined within this layer, similarly to the electrons, at least in this direction. And this, of course, is the valence band, and this is the conduction band. Now, to model this kind of problem, we need to look at the eigenstates of a particle, an electron or a hole, inside this particle-in-a-box problem, but it's only a particle-in-a-box in the z direction, just one of the three directions, which conventionally we'll call z. And that will give it, of course, envelope wave functions in the z direction, indexed by some quantum number, n. But the particle, the electron or the hole, is free to move in the other two directions. It's free to move transversely in the quantum well layer. So we're expecting free plane wave motion in the other two directions in the plane of the quantum well layer. 
And these plane wave motions we expect will have a wave vector that now we're going to put a subscript xy on it to show that this wave vector is only in the xy directions. To see this, we can formally separate the Schrodinger equation for the electron in the quantum well, and it will justify all of these statements that we've just made. So, in three dimensions then, the Schrodinger equation for the envelope function for, say, the electron, with an effective mass m effective here, will be the usual Schrodinger equation, but with a potential that only varies in the z direction even though this is a three-dimensional equation, root del squared. For quantum confined structures, such as quantum wires, which would be confined in two directions, or quantum boxes or dots, which would be confined in all three directions, the potential would then be a function of two directions or three directions, respectively, and would not merely be this one direction here, the z. So we can formally do this separation in the same way we've done various other separations by rewriting the envelope function equation, breaking it into parts here. We'll use a del squared xy here, which is just simply the second derivatives in both the x and y directions, and separately we've written out the second derivative in the z direction here. So far this is just merely a change of notation. And then we postulate a separation. We presume that the solution can be written as the product of a function only of z and a function only of the x and y coordinates, which we'll write as rxy, a vector in the xy plane. So, substituting this form here into the envelope function Schrodinger equation, and dividing by this same form throughout the entire equation leads to this version of the equation here. And we can formally separate this version by moving all of the quantities or entities in Rxy to one side, taking all of those that only depend on z and putting them on the other side, so together with the e, we know, as usual, that this only depends on Rxy, this only depends on z, so these both must be equal to some constant, and we choose that to be Exy. The left part of this equation here gives this equation once we rearrange it, so we merely take this and this and move the Psi Xy up to the right-hand side. This equation here is very simply solved for the in-plane motion. It's just free particle motion in the plane with a wave function that's just a plane wave in the plane with some kxy wave vector and an energy that is just h bar squared k squared xy, that is, over 2 times the effective mass. This is essentially the kinetic energy in the x and y directions. The right part of this equation, everything we see here, we define another constant, En is equal to E minus Exy for convenience here. This gives us the following equation, which we recognize as just a particle in a box like equation, but for the envelope function and with the effective mass in here. And we have our potential, the particle in a box like potential, V of Z. Now, the result of all of this is that the total allowed energies are the particle energies En for the particle in a box plus the additional energy associated with the in-plane motion. So we're going to sketch down here all of our allowed possible k values in the plane. So we have a ky direction and a kx direction, and we're going to plot energy in the vertical direction. And instead of discrete energy levels now, we have what are called subbands. So associated with the very first one of the confined levels in the z direction, which would have an energy of this amount, an En for n equals 1 of this amount, we now have a subband because we can keep on increasing the energy 
in the x and y directions with the motion in the plane of the layers. And I've drawn this subband here as if it ended at this point, but that's just for graphic convenience, so I can show you this oval to show you that it is a subband, a paraboloid of rotation. Actually, this subband keeps on going. And then there's a second one with this energy here being the E2 energy of the particle in the box and the bottom of the parabola. And then this parabola, or strictly a paraboloid of revolution, keeps on going, and it keeps on going up like this, and so on, to n equals 3, and so on. So as I said, note that the bottom of each one of these paraboloids of revolution is the energy corresponding to the En energy of the particle in a box. But note that the energy can keep on increasing arbitrarily in every one of these bands, each of them extends on up, giving us this complete so-called subband structure. <laughs>